the new edition of PES Win Magazine will have just come out when this podcast releases. So if you haven't got your edition in the mail, just go to PESWin.com and check it out. There's a lot of good articles in it. And we have some early insight into some of these articles. And one of them is about Halley Service. And uh, there's a really good discussion about why helicopters are more efficient moving technicians and equipment around than CTVs. And I, I think the U.S. is a perfect case here in some parts of Europe, obviously, because the wind turbines are not close to shore. And the, the ship runs, think about some of the ones off the East Coast here, off of New York, where they're like 40 miles from shore. That's a long time in a boat where you can make that run pretty quickly in a helicopter. And the, the arguments and the discussion about from a heli service, which operates in Europe, presently and is opening a place in the United States, is that uh, for CO2 burns, the helicopters emit about five kilograms of CO2 per kilometer, while the CTVs emit about 26 kilograms per kilometer, yet it's a big, massive ship moving through the water. It cannot be as efficient as a helicopter. Uh, but the, the item they pointed out in the North Sea, there's an agreement that they're going to try to reduce helicopter usage which is going to increase the carbon footprint, which makes no sense. And I mean, in particular, because Heli Service is using uh, some really new, relatively new helicopters, Augusta Westland 139 and 169 are some new helicopters they purchased in 2023. Uh, and they can use um, the synthetic uh, aviation fuel, which is a reduced CO2 emissions kind of fuel. Uh, so they can cut emissions by roughly 25%. It's starting to move towards helicopters, which makes sense, Phil. You you worked for Sikorsky for a while. I've done some helicopter work, not as much as you have. But I don't understand why helicopters have a bad name here, because they're, they're the most efficient way of moving people around. Yeah, well, that's a great question, because originally they were thought to be just too expensive for European projects. But that's back in the day. This was like 10 years ago or so when European projects were you know, 200 megawatts, and you couldn't really justify the cost of the helicopter to, you know, get people out there. And then how do you move them from turbine to turbine? You know, you were going to have to send the thing out there, retether them, you know, drag them all the way over to the other turbine and drop them off in, in the helicopter basket. Um, so it, it was looked at as being not particularly cost efficient. Um, now that said, those, that's not really the case anymore, obviously with projects that are, you know, eight, 900 megawatts, one gigawatt in size plus, um, where you've got, you know, 200 or 250, maybe 300 turbines in a project site now. And, you know, you can have CTVs that'll run people back and forth between the turbines, but getting people out to a turbine it's a uh, helicopter is definitely a faster way of accomplishing that. And like you mentioned, I mean, they're, they're also looking at either electric CTVs or methanol based CTVs, uh, even hydrogen based CTVs now in Europe where the turbines could even generate the hydrogen, the ships could, um, you know, recharge at the site. But I still, I'm not entirely convinced that plus you, you're, you've got an enormous fleet of um, you know, CTVs now that don't run on any kind of, you know, alternative fuel, whereas SAF, the whole point of it is it's kind of like a drop in thing. You don't really have to change that much in the engines and the components of uh, a jet engine or, or you know, those used on, on helicopters either to uh, accommodate the use of SAF. So it, it makes a heck of a lot more sense now, especially with the scale that projects have gotten to and the, frankly, the density of, of projects. Now, if you look at, at the North Sea, you've got tons more projects that can go service on a single run. Um, you know, you you're, can load those helicopters up. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that they, the Augusta Westlands or the Sikorsky S-92s or whatever they're, they're using these days probably can't even carry the amount of, of technicians they want to be able to send by helicopters. So I think Hella Service is going to be extremely busy. Yeah, I, t I talked with a friend of mine that used to work for uh, Vestas in the MHI Vestas days when they were commissioning offshore wind farms, and he was responsible for 
hey, we've built it. Now we're going to go into operations. So he was responsible for that handover. And he'll tell you all day long up and down that the helicopter is way more efficient, right? Because there's a lot of times that these things going on in these turbines, it's not like, hey, we need to go to that turbine and work all day. It's like one little task or one little part replacement or something like that. And so you're running out there, boom, dropping someone doing that. And then sometimes they're doing transfers at like the helipad on the, on the, um, either on an SOV or on the offshore substation because it's just easier. Right. Um, but one of the things that people don't realize as well is, okay, so all of these vessels that are in a wind farms, whether it's a CTV or it's a, uh, SOV when they're in DP mode. Okay. So DP mode is dynamic positioning. So that means that they're, they're held in one spot. And so either by satellites or multiple GPS systems, or even sometimes there's acoustic beams on the seafloor holding them in place, or, or if it's a DP3 vessel, which can be re really crazy, they have, they'll have things on the turbines monitoring the location of the vessel so it doesn't move. But if you ever look at those vessels, you'll see around them a bunch of white water. And why that is, is because to hold that position, all of the thrusters on these vessels are pushing against each other usually. So they're not just sitting there like with no throttle on going like, okay, we're going to sit in this spot. And if we move off, we'll, we'll hit the throttle a little bit. No, they're, they're, they're jacked up sometimes to 70% throttle, burning fuel all day long cruising. Or if you see like a CTV pushing, pushing people onto the, uh, or dropping people onto the transition piece, they're, they're 50% throttle with that thing, boom, pushing that boat against the, the monopile. So that's the, the fuel burn is not minimal when it comes to those any kind of offshore wind vessels let alone wind i'm just saying offshore work vessels in general oil and gas marine construction whatever they burn tons of fuel sometimes ten thousand gallons a day well it, it's just a better ride right if you're a technician and you gotta be on the in the north sea like that's a horrible place to ride in a boat and if you can avoid an hour or two of that why wouldn't you that's why the offshore oil platforms have done it that way forever. It's just more efficient. Go to Homa, Louisiana. They have a heliport there that go that services all of the oil rigs. There's a hundred. There's a hundred helicopters sitting there. It just it's a learned experience, right? I think the other thing that bothers me about the CTVs is any sort of rescue. You do not necessarily want to be put on a ship and then <laughs> towed towed to shore. Bounce back. Yeah, you're going to need a helicopter out there. If something serious were to happen, you really need a helicopter. And I guess the, the only question in my mind is when they're going to get to, like Phil was saying, something electric or something that's sort of a drone-based uh, system. We we saw those in Hamburg, right? We saw the, the bigger drones. They, they can't haul a person, but it wouldn't take a heck of a lot to haul a person, honestly. And yeah, it's it's just a matter of time. It, that's actually more of a regulatory issue than a technical one anyway. I mean, I'd, I'd do it. Like, if they made a, a drone that was capable of taking me out to an offshore wind turbine, I'd, I'd do it. Just a helicopter at that point. The first day I was on a helicopter, I pulled up to site, and there was a helicopter on a flatbed behind a truck that was trashed. It was wrecked. And I walked up past it, and the guy that walked up behind it goes, he goes, yeah, key is when you get out of the helicopter, because this was working oil and gas up in Alaska. When you get out of the helicopter in the snow, you want to stand right next to it while they take off. I was like, why? He's like, because sometimes the skids will get hooked underneath a log in a clear cut. And when they go to take off, it flips over. And he goes, he goes, you don't want to be out within 10 to 100 meters of this thing when it flips over. You want to be right next to it. And that was my first. And then uh, about an hour later, I was in a, heli in a helicopter that was exact same model, make everything painted the same color, taken off. I was scared out of my mind. Hey, Uptime listeners. We know how difficult it is to keep track of the wind industry. That's why we read PES Wind Magazine. PES Wind doesn't summarize the news. It digs into the tough issues. And PES Wind is written by the experts. So you can get the in-depth info you need. Check out the wind industry's leading trade publication, PES Wind at PESWind.com. 